I was thinking about this evening, and I was thinking about this book, and I have a question for you guys. Does anybody know what a Rube Goldberg contraption is? Yeah. yeah. So for those of you who don't know, I'll give you an example. There's this thing called, do you know what a Rube Goldberg is? Okay. So there's this thing called Mr. Butt's um, self-unfolding napkin. And it's one of these things where Mr. Butt sits down at his chair, and then something happens that trips this ladle, that then tosses a cracker to a parrot, and that does another thing, and that does another thing, and that does another thing, until finally like the string pulls, and the napkin unfolds in Mr. Butt's lap, when Mr. Butt could have just reached down and unfolded his own napkin. And I was thinking about that, and I was wondering if any of you guys feel like that's kind of what the internet health space is a little bit like right now. It's, it's a lot of steps to do what we all could do on our own. And I think that um, it's a very complicated space because there are many people with great intentions who want to help you have more and more information. But it's like for every one person, there's five different opinions. And each year, if you trace what they're doing, there's like their latest new diet with their new best-selling book. And I don't know about you, I mean, I'm a Yale-trained MD who's been doing this stuff for 35 years, and sometimes I see something and I'm like, wait, did I miss something? Did I, am I supposed to know about that? Was I supposed to tell my patients about that? So when Frank sent me the manuscript for his book, first of all, you all have it now. To me, it is so bright and so beautiful and so colorful that I just want to keep opening it. But it's also reminding us that we can unfold our own napkin in our lap that it's not that complicated. And so I really want to just dive deep with, with this conversation tonight about what led Frank to bring us something that puts our health back in our hands, kind of demystifies some of the confusing, complicating information that's out there that leads each one of us probably at some point in the course of a week to wonder, should I be eating that? Or should I not be eating that? Or should I take this adaptogen or should I take that and acetylcysteine, or should I just be doing none of it, or should I be eating breakfast or skipping breakfast? It's really confusing, right? And the reality is, is that for those of us who have been in this long enough, we see these cycles. This thing comes and this thing goes, and this thing comes and this thing, and then it comes back again. But the beauty of what you've brought to us in this book is the thread. There's, a, there's, a, there's like the string that goes through the pearls that never changes. So Frank, you have seen so much in this many, many decades of being in health and wellness. What about this book made you write it right now? Well, I, I think it's sort of what you said. There's, <coughs> um, there's a change in the culture. The millennials who I love, all of you, all of you are unbelievable. <laughs> they question authority. Um, they don't accept the status quo. They realize that the medical system is totally screwed up. It's not attending to their needs. Um, and they want something that's going to help them. And at the same time, there's just so much information out there. And it's, it's the wild west of wellness. And on top of that, no one's got any time. Everyone is so busy. So the idea was to take what I've learned over the last 40 years. And I've been lucky enough to study with unbelievable teachers, whether it was uh, traditional medical teachers in, in South Africa, who taught me to listen to patients. It was all about listening, because you'll get a diagnosis from taking a good history, to you know, moving on to Chinese medicine, and my Chinese medicine teachers, Ephraim Korngold and Harriet Barnfeld, who is where I met Steve Cowan, uh, to my yoga teacher, to all these, you know, Jeff Bland in, in functional medicine. I, I had the, the luck to, to study under so many unbelievable teachers, all of whom were um, very happy to teach me because I was an MD interested in this. And in those days, in, in this was starting in the early 80s, you know, MD, this, you know, no one knew about wellness or doctors in particular weren't that interested. So I was lucky enough that they would take me on and, and mentor me. And what I learned over all these years um, and, and what's become clearer and clearer is a lot of those teachings from all these traditions whether it's Eastern medicine or, or <coughs> Buddhism or um, functional medicine or just so many cultures are rich in basic tenets. And we forget about it in this day and age. We know we're looking, as you say, for the latest diet. We're looking for the latest supplement. And you realize that the most important things 
are the ordinary habits or the ordinary things you do on, the, on a daily basis. As I always say, it's those ordinary things that we do on a daily basis that have extraordinary healing benefits. So it was, how do you take those things? Because to me, music is medicine. To me, um, community is medicine. To me, being of service is medicine. All of these things that we take for granted and we don't think of them being medicine are actually medicine. All we think of medicine is taking a drug or maybe a supplement or having surgery. But, you know, music, which has been unbelievably helpful to me personally, is medicine. Um, there's so many aspects that we don't really look at as medicine that I feel have a healing effect. So I thought, why don't I take all this wisdom? And, and almost everything in this book is old wisdom. There's not that much. You know, everyone's saying, well, what's new in the book? I think what's new in the book is that we've known a lot of this stuff in the past. We, it just hasn't been articulated properly. Many cultures, you know, let's just take an example of lectins. You know, people didn't know about lectins, but most cultures did something to their food to decrease the amount of lectins in their food. You know, uh, we didn't know about intermittent fasting in the old days, but what Harriet and Ephraim taught me in Chinese medicine is to rest your digestion for at least 14 hours, 12 to 14 hours. So their understanding was, okay, if you eat uh, dinner earlier and eat breakfast later, you know, it's going to be really good for your digestion and therefore good for your body. They didn't talk about intermittent fasting and they didn't necessarily know about the physiological effects of what it does. But there are all these, these true, this understanding of the body and the human condition that come from these cultures that we sort of, not ignored, but we didn't, haven't taken seriously. So I thought putting it into a beautifully illustrated book and making it accessible to people and make people realize there's so much you can do for your own health that we're missing. And the last part is, and, and this has been sort of running through alternative stuff since I started, this concept of self-care that you are the author of your own health story. That's not really stressed. In Western medicine, you go to the doctor, and the doctor is an authority and tells you what to do. Whereas the way I see it, the way most cultures, or most, I think, intelligent people would see it, was you know your body better than anyone else. You know, there can be authorities. I can recommend something. You can recommend so something. But ultimately, you know your body. You know how you're going to take in that information and apply that information, information to your life. So the important thing is you need to take control. You need to be aware of yourself, how you, how you function in this world. So learning about yourself is key. So I, I just took all of this stuff and tried to put it into one easy-to-read book. Long, long answer for a sh short question. I like long answers. They're good. <laughs> so as you were talking, it dawned on me that the word medicine really has the word medi, right, to come to the center. One of the things that uh, I was hearing you say is this idea of being the author of your own, um, your own story. And that, that idea of kind of coming to the center was bubbling up in me as, as you were saying that. And so can you talk to us about finding your center and how you find your center in your life? How do you stay in alignment with yourself so that you're not pulled? Or how do you teach your patients to learn to be that author of their story and not be pulled out by every next thing that they read about or think that they should be doing? Well, first of all, I don't think it's that easy to be quite honest. It took me many, many, many years. I mean, I basically live in my head. Um, uh, what's, you know, re you know, and I think women have an easier time than men, to be quite honest, to listen to themselves, maybe because they have a period every month. Um, but what's really You know helped you're like the only man who could get away with saying that? And, and actually, like, oh, it sounds okay? right? <laughs> that's not, that's not, it's not wrong. Well, There's just a few uh, who could. No, it's, it's true. Um, it's an opportunity. Well... well <laughs> It's just, it's the truth. Women are much more in touch with their bodies. That's just the reality. Um, it makes them harder to deal with as patients, but it's... Uh... Okay, now... <laughs> um, so, I, you know, what's helped me the most was, you know, for, you know, I got into meditation through... I started with music. Music was my meditation, and then yoga, um, and eventually meditation. And now I have 
a habit of meditating every day, and I think that's changed my life. What's changed the way I respond to the world? I'm sure my staff, my wife, my health coaches um, would probably agree, knowing me for long enough. Is that true? Well, the person to ask is my daughter, because she always tells the truth. Um, <laughs> so I, I think you need to just spend time with yourself. You need to um, go inward. You know, we, we so you know we live our lives. You know, looking out and, and bringing everything in. So it's just spending time going inwards. And yeah. um, I don't think it's as hard as I th always thought it was, to be quite honest. I just think you need to find something. You know, there's a, there's a, li there's a line that my daughter taught me, and she, she always says, I've got to say it's not my line or her line. It's neurons that wire together fire together. Yeah. And I love that line because if you can make anything into a habit, you don't have to think about it. You know, the brain loves habits when you don't have to think about it. So it's about doing something over and over again. And if you do something over and over again, if you just get into a habit of meditating, you get into a habit of doing yoga, you get into a habit of going for a walk in the forest, whatever it is, then the neurons, it becomes automatic. So the, I think the trick is to, to make these, these practices habits. If you can change an unhealthy habit into a healthy habit, then things start changing and then, then there's a ripple effect and that's sort of where the mandala comes in. So the idea is to just you know, get those neurons to fire together. So one of the things that you and I talk about in our conversations offline are, um, is the complexity that I think is evolving with integrative and functional medicine, both of which we practice, and the concerns that we've had with the volume of testing and the volume of sort of functional diagnoses. So people can walk into a doctor's office these days, a, a functional or integrative doc, more functional, and walk in feeling okay with some symptoms and walk out feeling like they're a walking time bomb, right? And they have mitochondrial dysfunction and they have MTHFR and a lot of people are kind of freaking out. And I think that it's, in some ways, it's taking the health out of people's hands in a different kind of way but also it implies to me almost a mistrust of the body's ability to heal from simple things, right? We get these tests and then we need all these supplements and more tests and more supplements. And sometimes you and I both know some people do actually need that, but your book is a departure from that trend. It's really drilling into, as you said to me in one of our conversations, the extraordinary power of ordinary things. So can you talk to us about how you um, came to really, tr or what your philosophy is about trusting the body's innate capacity to heal and how these simple, small shifts can make big changes in health. Right. I, I mean, I think what happens when you do this over and over again, and I went through, you know, when I started out in functional medicine, and by the way, we have two uh, masters of medicine in this room, Dr. Steve Cowan, probably the best pediatrician around, and Leo Gallen, Leo's here too, two of my idols in medicine, who listen to people. And, uh, you know, as I got taught in, in, in South Africa, it was interesting, when we got trained as doctors, we didn't have all the money to do all these tests that they do here. So you had to take a really good history. So you had to, I mean, I, it was drummed into us that you're going to get your diagnosis from the history. So it sort of got, you know, it, it sort of penetrated. You, you always have to listen to the patient and, you, and you'll, you'll get the diagnosis. When I started in functional medicine, I started doing all these tests like everyone else. And I started noticing, well, the tests are interesting because I'm sort of getting the same results. And, and um, I probably knew this. Without, you know, the results aren't really helping me. And even when the results I thought were X, Y, and Z, I started treating the results and not the patient. I think that's, a, you know, we've talked about this. I'm not saying it's wrong to do all this testing and there's a place for testing. I think what does happen when we test too much, especially when you're not an experienced physician and you get into the stuff and it's so exciting. I mean, when you start learning the stuff, it's like, it's mind-blowing. It's exciting. It works. It's, it's, uh, Dots get connected. Yeah. So you start doing these tests and you start treating the test results, which is a problem. I've, I think I've always been blessed to go into this via Chinese medicine and once again have teachers who drum things into into you and um, you know what, what got drummed into me in Chinese medicine is the body heals itself. You've got to remove the obstructions to healing or try and, and, and add something to to get the body to work you know better. So 
you know, when you're doing acupuncture, you know, when you first start doing acupuncture, and I'm still amazed, and people get better from the weirdest things just by putting needles in, you start going, whew, this is interesting. I mean, this just doesn't make sense. So you really start believing in the capacity of the body to heal itself. Because what's acupuncture? You're putting in needles, you, you know, you're poking holes in someone's body, and they're getting better. I mean, that's pretty mind-blowing. I mean, it just doesn't make sense from a Western perspective. And it took me a long time to really get that. So I think I was just lucky enough to get trained in South Africa and lucky enough to, in my initial part of this journey, was to have these brilliant, brilliant minds and teachers who really you know, you know, taught me a, a, a new way of thinking. So I think you know, once you start realizing that the body heals itself and your job is to remove the obstructions to healing or try help the body in some way heal itself, it changes your whole, your whole perspective. Yeah, I call it the two simple questions. And now that is really what I sit down with every patient. I think, what's blocking the body's innate healing capacity? What's in excess here? And then what's deficient? What's missing that I could add? And it's really amazing. We can even just stop and ask ourselves that question about our own lives or our own bodies. So you took this Eastern philosophy and did something really beautiful with this book which Steve inspired, and I didn't know that he was yeah. a mandala maker until tonight. He's an unbelievable artist, mandala maker. So what happened was uh, I, for so many years, was trying to understand how Western medicine worked from a Chinese perspective. I mean, it used to bother me for so long when I got into Chinese medicine. I used to say to myself, this is the same body. These are just two different languages. How, you know, what the hell is going on? You know, when the Chinese talk about qi and block qi and dampness and I just it, I was struggling to understand Western medicine from a Chinese perspective and then I eventually I sort of got it you know Qi now to me are the mitochondria you know it's simple the the meridians are now the fascia in fact I saw a week ago researchers say they've discovered this inter this new organ system the interstitial tissue it's a fascia it's a meridian system so I, I took me a while to sort of really get, and then I listened to Jeff Bland talk about improving function and creating balance. So it all started coming together from understanding Western medicine from a Chinese medicine perspective. And then when I was writing the book and thinking about the book, and I spend, you know, Steve Cowan is my real brother in, you know, brainstorming stuff. And Steve is a man, I don't know how it came about, but... Um, I got this idea, why don't I put my knowledge of Western medicine now and everything I know into this Eastern concept, which is, has been actual, you know, if, you, if anyone's been to my office, there's mandalas in every room. Um, some, one of them or two of them made by Steve. Um, so I thought, how do I put all this information into a mandala? Because this is not a linear program. You know, I'm, I'm used to like putting people on a cleanse, boom, 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 you do X, Y, and Z, and then you go here. So this, was, this is circular, and this is a much more Eastern way of um, seeing the body and applying these, these concepts. So wait, so, let's stop for one second, if you don't mind. So I'm assuming people are here at ABC, they know what a mandala is, but maybe not everyone does. So if you could just clarify when you're talking about the mandala, then, explain what you mean. Sure. So mandalas have been used in, in Eastern traditions, and not only Eastern uh, traditions, um, as a symbol of not only healing, but really learning about oneself. You know, I remember uh, how many years ago, I don't know if it was uh, Bob Thurman or one of, or one Buddhist meditation class I took, and they were, you know, they teach you to meditate on a mandala, to learn to know yourself. Um, and uh, so this mandala is, uh, uh, basically an image of, 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 of wholeness and, and something that one learns or, or, or be, gains awareness about oneself on every level, physical, uh, emotional, f um, spiritual. And um, there's usually something in the middle, a palace or something in the middle, and then there are four gates, east, west, north, south, um, and then these circles. So I sort of thought when I was speaking to Panos, it went from from Steve drawing these mandalas for me to going to Panos to say, okay, Panos, let's make this work from a less esoteric, you know, and we sort of played around with it and we came up with you in the middle because 
It's ultimately about you. And, uh, you know, uh, some key elements that these gates, you know, the rhythm balance, microbiome and inflammation, which I think are the key four, four of the key underlying dysfunctions. And then branching out into these six areas, these six circles, how to eat, how to sleep, how to move, how to protect, how to unwind, and how to connect. So putting all these um, concepts into one uh, symbol of meditation. And the idea, I don't know if it really came out that way, but I would like to think so. The idea that Panos and I had at, at one stage was we're going to create this image which people can meditate on and learn about themselves. I think that's asking a little bit much, but it, it did come out as a beautiful image. Um, so, so that was the idea, and, and the idea that you can enter, I love the idea that you can enter at any point, because what we've seen in, in the practice is for some people, you tell them to stop eating sugar, and they love it, and they do well. Men are actually really good at like, just tell me, I need to do X, Y, and Z, and they do it, and they do great. Women are a little bit more complicated, and um, not in a bad way, okay? No, it's true. So, I so mean, with, so, we so, have hormonal changes exactly. that change our appetites and our... Absolutely. So the point is with women, it needs to be a little bit more nuanced. And for some people, if you just show them, if you're a little bit kinder to your spouse, that may be your way into health. If you sit around a table with your family, that may be a way into health. If you get a dog, that may be a way... So, I think different people need to enter their, their health story at, at points that they can choose and also dictate the speed that they make the changes. You know, I'm, I'm guilty of putting people on two-week cleanses to get them going because I believe if people have the subjective experience of wellness, they're going to stay on the path. Yeah, that's one way, but there are many ways. So the idea was to, to create a system that there is no one way, there are many ways to the same end point. So let's talk about the pillars that make up the mandala, because now you've been in practice for 25 years or so? 28 years? 32 years? Uh, 40, almost. Really? 30, ah. 39 years. That's amazing. 79, 79, That's 70, incredible. 40, yeah. So An quite a long time, and yet you've come down to six pillars. Let's talk about how you've decided on these. Well, you know, when you write a book, you always have to have some type of structure. Um, so the idea was to create some type of structure that people can think about and then fit all these um, tips or these um, areas that people can make changes in and, and create healthy habits into that structure. So the structure was, you know, everyone knows how to eat or anyone, everyone knows that it's important we need to learn how to eat or what's the best way of eating for ourselves. And there is no, sorry, I'm not looking at anyone here. Sorry, my back's to you. Um, so there is no one right diet for everyone. So the idea is teaching people how to eat and learn about themselves. Sleep I put as a second pillar. So I went from, in the pillars, I went from the most material in the center to the most spiritual or ethereal in the, in the outer circle. So, you know, if, uh, um, one person I forgot to thank is my writer, Amelie, who's not here, who's in San Fran, who's in L.A. or San Francisco, who is unbelievable. To, to, she, was, she just took this information and, and ran with it. So, sorry, Amelie, um, in abstention. So, so you, we went from the most material how to eat, and then I put how to sleep, because we, no one takes, not no one, too many people don't take sleep seriously enough. And sleep is such a key function, and it's something that you have control of, over. You know, you have so much more control than, than, than you think. So I put that second, then how to move. Note I talk about how to move and not exercise, because I think it's moving your body. It's not necessarily going to the gym, which is fine, going to the gym. I know there's some trainers here, but it's, it's moving your body. Um, and then how to protect. You know, in this day and age, there's so many chemicals out there we need to learn how to deal with all the, you know, we bombarded with all these chemicals. We need to learn where they're coming from and how to improve our body's functions and how to deal with them. And then how to unwind or relax, which is dealing with the stress, obviously. And then how to connect, which is one, once again such a key aspect of our healing that we forget about. And connecting is connecting with 
oneself, which we, you talked about, connecting with your community, which I think we're sort of losing. I mean, Facebook communities are great, but you know, real live interaction with your community is really important. And connecting with the earth at large. I mean, we, we're living in a period where oh, I'm going to have to get political. I mean, is Scott Pure? We see what he's doing. I mean, the, like. And to not realize that what's going on with the, the climate and what's going on in the environment is not going to affect our health is so ignorant. Um, you know, so, you, so connecting you talked about, to that, yeah. Sorry. You talked about um, bringing Eastern philosophy into Western medicine, thinking through that lens. And for me, the way I always think about any field of medicine or any philosophy of medicine is that it represents the culture. It's the story of the culture, right? So our story of Western medicine is very reductionist, mechanistic, poison the body. It really reflects how we are treating the earth. When I think of Chinese medicine, it's based on the cosmology and on everything is related to an element, right? So it, it is what connects us back to the earth. So I think that to me, that is one of the core differences in how I think about what we do as Western doctors versus what we do, what every other culture does, which is connected to the earth. Um, so how do you recommend for people who are living in the city, for example, that maybe they could spend a little bit more time every day? I know there's been studies, for example, that just having houseplants in your yep. home or your office can change your, your adrenal stress response, for example. What are some of the things that you right. well, recommend? Well, you know, just to take your point you know, a step further, what I got taught which is so clear, is we as humans are microcosms of the macrocosm at large, of the earth at large. And to not um, realize that what's going on around you is not going to affect you is, is crazy. So, I mean, I think even in the city, it, there's no question it's, everything's harder in the city on, on one level. Um, your default choices are, are generally unhealthy. You've got to put more effort into it. But... You know, even if you go for a walk in the park, you know, every morning, you know, I'm a big believer in the morning going for a walk. You start getting your circadian, you know, you start getting natural light. Um, at night, I know it's noisy and, and there may be lots of lights. You darken your room. If you can't darken your room, you wear an eye mask. So there, there are ways around most of it. I mean, a lot of um, the problems I see today are, are not even... A city as opposed to what we're doing, you know, with the technology. You know, I was in L.A. recently, and um, I thought things would be a little bit more mellow there. People are worse with their phones. They're, they're on their phones all the time. Um, so I think there's a lot you can do, especially with your phone and your, and, and your computer. Um, so I think there are little things, you know, what can do. You know, I think having a pet, you know, I'm trying to convince my wife into getting a dog again. We you guys can borrow and, ours for a while okay. to see. But dogs are so, I mean, look, everyone knows, you know, a lot of what I talk about in the book, everybody knows, everyone knows how good you feel, you know, when a dog is, when a dog loves you and you love a dog. Everyone knows how good you feel when you go for a walk on the beach. Everyone knows how good you feel when you start doing good for others. So um, there's a lot of things, this is, this is what the whole premise of the book is about you can do this in New York it's not that difficult yeah it's maybe a little bit harder because you've got to deal with all the traffic and the stress and that ever but you know driving a car in LA is probably worse than New York but so I, I, I don't necessarily buy into that and, and I think the book sort of is a, a, a solution to that dilemma because there are little things that you can do on a daily basis that can overcome that I've kind of started to think that a lot of our ills, our modern ills, are what I call, which is not my term, from psychoneuroimmunology and evolutionary mismatch. That how we're living is just not how we were adapted to live, right? The changes that have happened in our food and in our environment in the last 70 years were not there at all before. We had decent food before 70 years ago. We didn't have better living through chemistry. And I think that, for me, what your book does is it kind of resets us out of that evolutionary mismatch and it reminds us that there are these tools within our hands that aren't complicated, that don't require technology, that don't require knowing everything about functional medicine or everything about a diet or everything about your methylation pathways, that you can actually make some really big shifts. So 
How does this fall into your practice when people come to you and they want you to fix them? Because you're a Western doctor, even if they know that you're coming for something different. What is it that you do with patients? Let's say any one of these wonderful people came to you. How would you help them find the plan for themselves and how can they find that in your book? Well, the practice has changed in a way in the last couple of years. We're seeing a lot of sick young women in particular. Um, but I sort of do the same thing. I mean, these guys can tell you if I'm telling the truth. I ha you, know, you, you have to inspire people and motivate people to make change. Sometimes you've got to scare them a little bit, especially older people. You've got to say, and, and some of my patients here will confirm that, you know, you've got to say to them, listen, if you continue down this path, you know, your mind's going to go, you want to spend time with your grandchildren, you're not going to be able to move probably. So you, I think a little bit of fear for some people is good. You always have to somehow inspire and motivate them. But ultimately, if you can get someone to feel better fairly quickly, then you've got them hooked. If you can get someone to realize that they can get better at making these changes... Um, then you're sort of your job's done. Then you're just guiding them. And I've been blessed to work with health coaches in the last, what, I don't know, five, six, seven, I don't know. And my health coaches are unbelievable because I can give people information, but when you have someone guiding and supporting them with the specifics, it really helps a lot. So um, I think it's a combination of everything. You've got to know who's sitting in front of you. Some people want X, Y, and Z, other people, you sort of got to see where they're at and meet them where they're at. Um, but ultimately, I think if you can get someone to feel better quickly, then you've got them hooked. So, um, and, and, and definitely with older people, not the millennials are completely different. The millennials, like, it's, it's fantastic. Uh, millennials see the world that we, you know, we don't even have to convince them. Like, you, they, they come in. I see so many young women who come in with their mothers because they've worked out what's going on with them and they bring in their mothers to say, see Ma, I told you so. <laughs> um, they've worked out what's going on with them, so it's really interesting. So with millennials, it's, it's, you're working differently with you just sort of, you fine tuning what they're doing already and you're telling them what a great job they're doing because most of them are doing a great job and you just fine tuning them. For older people, um, who don't really get it, you, you, I find just scaring people a little bit, not too much. Well, not like telling the truth. Yeah, not like Western medicine does. Yeah. I mean, Western medicine scares the shit out of you. And, like, <laughs> and, and it's usually, anyway, we won't go there. But it, I think you need to somehow tell people if they don't make a change that um, something negative is going to happen. And, you know, the majority of people we see you realize that lifestyle changes make this huge difference in their health. But ultimately, I think people need to have a subjective experience of wellness or vitality or feeling better to keep them hooked, especially our generation. We've talked about cutting back on the electronics a little bit, especially before bed. We've talked about sleep being critically important and a little bit more time in nature. So what about food? I know you talk about um, simplicity, returning to basics, but you also have some details about ketogenic diet and intermittent fasting, and I think many of you probably have heard these terms and are curious, yes? What are your thoughts on, for the general person who's feeling pretty well, or for someone who's feeling a little more unwell? Right, well, ketogenic diets are really interesting, and I'm really intrigued by ketogenic diets, and I know it's the hot thing at the moment, but I think there's no one right diet for everyone. As a general rule, the ketogenic diet tends to work better for people who want to, not everyone once again, for people who want to lose weight, for people who sort of pre-diabetic or, or have a carbohydrate intolerance. They get tired after they eat or... Yeah, yeah. They, they're eating too many carbohydrates for their body's mm -hmm. metabolism per se. And, you know, the blood test can help with that. And as an anti-aging tool, I think it's pretty good. Um, and I think as a general rule, ketogenic diets tend to work better with older people than with younger people. 
Um, but to me, a ketogenic diet is a therapeutic diet. I don't think people need to be on a ketogenic diet long term. Some people do it. I think it's very difficult to do. I don't think it's necessary. So, um, so when we talk about therapeutic diets, this is something we talk about together, is um, the idea of how you eat when you're sick and trying to get well versus how you eat every day for nourishment when you're generally well, just to clarify. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm, I'm intrigued. The ketogenic diet, we've seen people do really well. I'm, I'm relatively new to it. I don't have tons of experience with it. I still don't think it's necessary for everyone, but I think it's worth exploring. And you know, some people don't do well on a ketogenic diet. I mean, you just got to learn about your body. It's not right for everyone. You know, same as a vegan diet is not wrong for everyone. I think it's wrong for a lot of people, more people than, re than realize. Um, but some people it works really well for. So it's, once again, it's all about learning about your body and seeing what works for you because there is no one way. There is no one right diet. I, I think ultimately you need to eat lots of green leafy vegetables, maybe cruciferous vegetables. You know, you need to eat a good amount of healthy fats and some good sources of protein. I mean, the whole grain thing, I don't, you know, the more I do this, I don't think people need grains, beans maybe, some people do better than others. So the carbohydrate thing, I think as we get older, generally people do better on a low carbohydrate diet, the majority of people, um, myself definitely. Um, I became pre-diabetic by eating lots of grains and, and fruit and I was sort of I didn't eat too much meat at that stage, and I thought I was eating a healthy, low-fat diet, lots and lots and lots of fruit growing up in South Africa. I became pre-diabetic, and when I shifted my diet to eating all what was thought to be the wrong food, lots of meat, um, although I eat only grass-fed meat, um, and lots of chicken and, and eggs and that, everything corrected. And when I look at pictures of myself, Alison's bat mitzvah and that I was chubby. I didn't even realize I was chubby until the, uh, you know. So, you know, I, I don't think there's one right way. I mean, Janice, my wife, does better on, on she doesn't do as well on as high fat. I do better on higher fat. So everyone's different. The one important thing I will say about a high fat diet or ketogenic diet, you've got to be a low, a low carb at the same time. I mean, you know, I some people come in eating lots of fat and, you know, they have bulletproof coffee for breakfast with a muffin. doesn't work. <laughs> if you're going to do a bulletproof coffee, which I'm all for, you don't have a muffin. So if you're going to eat high fat, it's really important to eat low carb at the same time. It's essential to eat low carb. But once again, I don't think, you know, I just did a, a podcast with Rich Roll, who is like, I always use him as my example of this really healthy vegan. I mean... I don't think a vegan diet works for too many people, but it sure works for him. I can't, I can't deny that. Different stages in our lives, yeah. Too, right? Well, he's older too. Yeah. And 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 he said to me, he's not attached to his diet, but until it stops working for him, that's how he's going to eat. Yeah. So I respect that. I think we all need to respect. There is no one way. I mean, we have lots of patients who are unhealthy vegans, and we have some patients who are vegans and are doing fine. I don't know how long it's going to last, but. That's fine. You've got to learn to listen to your body. I agree. I think for me as a woman, <laughs> a complicated woman, <laughs> um, for me, I think, too, just recognizing that they're, they're every different phase of my life is different. So when I was in medical school, I mean, I could have eaten a, a cow and eggs five times a day. I was just craving protein with all that brain work. But when I was in my teens and early 20s, even through several pregnancies, being vegan or vegetarian was great. But it's like when you start to recognize, I'm not feeling like my spark plugs are operating on all cylinders. I know that's a terrible metaphor. I don't know anything about cars, but <laughs> you know what I mean. Um, you know, really, it is for me about uh, what I call dropping in, right? Just actually stopping, stopping at different points in the day and say, how am I feeling? And noticing the connection of what I'm doing and what I'm feeling. I think a lot of my patients, for example, have never had anyone connect the dots that if you're feeling tired two hours after a meal, it might have been something you ate or didn't eat at breakfast. Um, how about we, should we take some questions? We have about 10 minutes. Uh, how does that interaction take place on a daily basis? What responsibilities do you delegate, share? Uh, just kind of maybe explain how that works. Uh, I delegate everything. I mean, they do everything. <laughs> Um, well, how it works, in the old days when people used to come to me, I would have 
uh, in the early days, I didn't even have forms to give out. I'd say, stop eating gluten, stop eating dairy, stop eating sugar, boom, bye, I'll see you in a couple of weeks. And then I progressed to giving handouts to people. And then when health coaches came along, and I didn't even realize how helpful health coaches would be until I started, by chance, having one in the office. I mean, it was, I didn't even think about it, it just happened by chance. Um, we needed a health coach to answer questions. I started a supplement company. We needed a health coach to answer questions online. And she was in the office and she just started working with my patients. And that's how it started. So I had no idea what a health coach was or how important they were. And then I realized um, that when people would sit down with the with a health coach and would, uh, you know, they would... You know, I would say, okay, stop eating gluten, stop eating dairy, yada, yada, yada. Then they'd sit down with the health coach, and the health coach would then say to them, okay, well, Dr. Lippin said you've got to stop eating gluten. Here are some alternatives. You can maybe um, make some uh, vegetable noodles, or you can, there's this pasta you can get made from almond flour. This is where you get it. When you go to a restaurant, this is what you can order. So they were giving the patient's specific information on how to actually do what I was recommending. And actually this book is an outgrowth of, what, of the work of my health coaches because I would say to someone, well, you've got to start meditating. And they would sit down and they'd say, okay, you can start with this app, you can start with Headspace or Calm, or this is a way you can learn to breathe. So they were actually teaching the patients how to apply what I had told the patients to do. And they were supporting them through that. Now, that's priceless. I, I, I had no clue how important that was until, until I saw it happening with my patients. So I was lucky enough to, they just fell into my lap. Um, not, but you know what I mean. Um, so, uh, <laughs> oops, sorry. Um, <laughs> You know what I mean. So um, th th that's how so that's how they work in the office. So that, uh, I'll see a patient, and the health coach will sit with me, and hear the story, and we'll come up with a plan. And then the health coach, then I usually give a patient the acupuncture, and then they sit down with the health coach afterwards, and the health coach helps them implement the changes that I'm recommending, and then supports them through it. That's stuck. Not unheard of anymore, because now lots and lots of doctors are doing it. But I think it's essential. I mean, I think it's very hard to implement the changes without having that support system. I mean, you go to a trainer and you go to a yoga teacher, whatever it is. Why shouldn't you have someone who's going to support you with these type of changes as well? My question is, I'm approaching menopause. And for the first time in my life, I'm experiencing crazy mood swings, um, maybe mild depression, anxiety, all these things that like I haven't been prepared for my entire life. Um, I've never medicated. And so now I'm sort of confronted with all of these incredible feelings with the hormones. And um, I wake up in the middle of the night, panic, sweats, like panic, like deep, dark panic, and um, I'm just wondering, like, is it, is, there, is it all diet? Is it diet and exercise? Is it a combination of everything? Where do I go? It's all <laughs> above. It's a combination. Uh, um, Aviva probably can answer this. This is what, this is what you do, right? Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I, it's yes, it's diet, but it's everything. It's uh, the more you can create a, a more balanced ecosystem, the better you're going to feel. So you know the way I, I it gets a bit boring because the way I work is pretty simple. You tend to recommend similar things for different problems, and most people get better. That's the trick, or that's the beauty, or you know people don't really realize it's not that difficult. If you stop eating sugar, you cut back on your sugar. If you start doing some yoga or meditating, if you just slow down a little bit, if you do all the things that I recommend in the book, the chances are you're going to feel better. Now, you can take it to the next level with some herbs and, 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 and whatever. But um, for the most part, 
I think if you do those basic, you know, if you create these healthy habits, you know, uh, until I started recommending, for instance, when women used to come in with the, your, your type of symptoms and we'd put them on a cleanse or not really a cleanse, but we'd get them off sugar, I didn't realize how important sugar was to these type of symptoms. So the diet can affect all these symptoms. Exercise, relaxation can affect all these symptoms. So yes, it's a whole package. And then Aviva will take it one step further with... Well, my next book is on hormones, so I'm going to start okay. something fun this summer, just as an aside. So, so check out my Facebook page when you get a chance, because we're going to start in June this thing called Wine and Gyne, <laughs> which is online. You don't have to have wine. But it's just we're going to do this Facebook Live to talk about hormone issues. But what I want to do, because um, we only have a limited time, and I want to stay focused on your book and what you're doing, and to bring it back to what your question is, is back to this idea of a mandala. Because it's complex, right? There's a lot of things that um, contribute to what women are experiencing with, with hormones. Frank mentioned environmental toxins and being aware of those. And by the time we reach a certain age, also, we've accumulated a certain amount of environmental exposure. Our mitochondria have experienced a certain amount of stress. We're all under stress. Um, one of the things that I started doing a couple of years ago in my practice when I remember to is actually encouraging my patients to actually get a mandala coloring book. Have you guys seen those mandala coloring books? So the power of, of a mandala, but also the power of remembering sacred transitions, which I think we also forget about. We forget the power of ritual. At ABC, they don't, right? You look everywhere, these beautiful altars, there's color. There are things that bring us back to those moments of joy and happiness and inner peace. So it's more complex when you've got a lot of menopausal symptoms going on. But some of the simple things that we can do are often really understated. And so I want to bring it back to Frank and the mandala. And I do encourage everyone to spend time with mandalas. So I think it's an incredible thing that you've done to bring this book back into the form of a mandala and to connect Eastern wisdom and Western knowledge. And that's a big piece, I think, with menopause is there are these transitions in life, becoming a mom, going through puberty, um, basically everything complex women go through. Men go through their own things too. I heard someone say men go through menopause like several times a day though. So we'll just, we'll just say. But um, there's a lot of these life transitions that we don't necessarily stop and honor. And so stopping and honoring that you're going through a big change is really important. I think with menopause, with aging, our culture is so youth focused. It is the millennials really own the world right now. And the good thing about millennials is they're getting the beauty in every age, right? They're looking to women like us to say, well, how do I live healthy and make those changes? And I think, you know, I just really want to honor you. In my medical practice, so I started out as a midwife. I started out as an herbalist. It was really about the basics. And what was amazing is I saw the basics work. And then I went to medical school. And as Steve pointed out when we were chatting earlier, what you learn in medical school largely helps the 1% of people who are in trauma. And we're all in some kind of trauma, I think, the times we're living in. But that's a different kind of trauma. Right? Like That's a car accident trauma or a horrible incident trauma. Um, so I want to honor you for this book. I think it was actually very courageous in a time when people are publishing books with the next latest complex gimmick that's brand new. It was very brave of you to bring us back to basics and to very simply remind us that the power of being well isn't in a Rube Goldberg contraption that teaches us what we already can do, which is open our own napkin and feed ourselves and try to sleep well and return to nature. So I want to really thank you for that because it's easy to start to think from our vantage point, right? If we're publishing a book, it has to be the next greatest new thing that everyone's going to want. And I want to encourage each of you as you open Frank's book, which I hope you will. And you know, and I say this with all like delight and respect when I got my hard copy in the mail. It reminded me of one of those like fourth grade science textbooks. <laughs> and I was like, I was just filled with delight. I was just delighted by it. So I hope that as each of you opens the book, you find that delight that brings you back to that child center and reminds you to play and reminds you to enjoy your life and enjoy your food. Because I, I feel like that's what you've also returned to us in the book is that simple pleasure and the simple enjoyment. So thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah. Are there? <laughs> so if 
if you would leave everyone with one last thought for the evening, maybe something simple to think about as they're going to sleep tonight to help them have an easier sleep or one word that you would like to share? Well, it's not really one word. It's the idea of creating healthy habits. The idea that the ordinary actions we do on a daily basis have extraordinary healing benefits. Don't take them for granted. They're just as important as any drug. More important. <laughs>